All right, welcome everybody. Apologies for the technical hitches to begin with. Um, Zoom has decided to let everybody in apart from most of the speakers, which would make for a very dull conference. And I'm not going to subject you to me for an entire four hours. Nobody needs that for their Saturday. Um, so we're going to be kicking off in just a moment. Um, thanks everybody for joining. We've got some really great speakers today. So what we're going to be going through is a number of ways that you can improve your practice, both from a clinical perspective, but also from a marketing perspective, from a business perspective as well, so that we can really make 2023 the best year possible for you. Um, so we're going to be approaching this from a number of different angles. Um, we've got Simon Billings talking about the, new, the mechanical and um, metabolic interface, which is really important for getting better results. I found personally using a lot of this work has actually improved referrals as well as um, actually improving patients' results as well, which is great. Um, we've got Rosie Piercy. She's going to be talking all about how to attract your ideal practice, your ideal patient, thinking about your clinic's personality, um, which is a really important way because you can just bring in regular patients or you can think about the patients that work best for you, that you get good results, who tend to stick with you. So instead of just thinking, I need more new patients, helping you find the ideal patient and then to see that your practice is exactly what they've been looking for. And we've got Stefan Boston as well. He's talking all about interdisciplinary care and a number of ways that we can really improve the whole profession and improve the level of care by working beyond just our own practice and beyond just individual chiropractors as well. Um, Stefan and I have had a number of conversations this over the last couple of years. He's doing some very exciting stuff as well that I think is going to bring chiropractic to an entire other level. And you'll have me as well talking about the story circle. This is a really, really key concept that you can use in many ways in your practice. I've been teaching chiros how to use this with their patients for a while, but we're also going to apply it to marketing and to empowering your team as well, whether that's front desk team, other clinicians, associates, ways that you can improve their practice and improve your whole clinic by tactically using stories. So that's what we're going to be going through. We will have a break partway through at around half past 10, give or take. We're going to be a little bit flexible with the time there, but we'll have a couple of speakers, a little break for everyone, and then a couple of speakers more. And then we're going to end this with a panel discussion as well with a Q&A. So if you have any questions, pop them in the chat as we go. What we're going to do is select some questions to ask the speakers immediately afterwards, if it's relevant to just them, if it's something specific. Other questions, though, we might pause them and we might actually use those for the panel discussion at the end. If it's something that is a broader question that we want to get multiple people's perspectives on as well. So it'll be a nice interactive morning for you guys as well. I'm going to ask that everybody keeps themselves on mute where possible, just to avoid interrupting if, if Zoom jumps about other people's cameras and things. Um, but if you do have any questions, by all means, pop them in the chat and we'll be getting back to you. There'll always be somebody looking at the chat. Generally, the speakers themselves won't be, but we can field questions to them towards the end as well. So that's the kind of basic runtime for today. Uh, without further ado, we're going to kick off with Rosie. So Rosie is a chiropractor. She's been in practice for a couple of decades now, I think, Rosie. Uh, I think 17 years, 17. I think. I would like to say that because it feels like a long time. <laughs> For some years, we'll say that. Um, so she's practiced as an associate, as a chiropractor, a total chiropractor. She runs a multidisciplinary clinic with 16 other therapists. I, think. I, I tend to lose count, but yeah, I think it's 16 yeah. at the moment. A big clinic with a lot of other people working there. She also runs the Practice Builders podcast, the Practice Builders community. And she coaches chiropractors and clinicians in basically how to run their practice more effectively so that it's not so stressful, so it's not overwhelming, and making the business part much, much easier. So she's got a ton of experience to share there as well. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Rosie, and she's going to talk to us all about our clinic's personality. Perfect. Right, I'm just going to share my screen. Oh, I can't share my screen, Chris. I'm going to make you host for that. This is okay. something we did anticipate, I think. There we go. So that should allow you now, Rosie. Hold on. Can you tell we haven't done a virtual conference before? Right, let's have a look. Right, now hopefully we can all see my screen um, and we can all see my slides. Perfect. Excellent. So hopefully we can all see this. Anyone, let me have any problems, Chris, I'm sure you'll let me know. 
Right, so I'm talking about um, your clinic's personality. Is this bit in the way or not? I can never know how to move that. Um, clinic's personality. So it, to, if you create a personality for your clinic, it will become a, the go-to place for your ideal patient. Um, so Chris has already introduced me as a chiropractor at Total Chiropractic. I'm the clinic director of Total Health West Berkshire and the founder of the Practice Builders Community. Um, there's three ways that I work with people generally with my podcast, Facebook group and one-to-one -one coaching. So now I'm going to get into clinic's personality. So you might be thinking, why, what, what on earth is she talking about? Why do we think about a, a clinic's personality? Well, your clinic's personality is how your clinic comes across to your patients. So it's how we, we people feel about your clinic when they think about it or when they're told about it. The way I want you to think about it is if you're at a party and somebody walks into a room, then often people give off a vibe, don't they? And there might be people that I know they look great, they have a good personality, they're interesting and people are drawn to them. Or you have that person that's slightly odd that everyone avoids. Now, obviously, we want to make our clinic something that people are drawn towards and not that something that people want to avoid. Clinic personality is your book personality is basically another way of saying clinic brand and you have two parts to this you have brand identity and brand image brand identity is generally the outside the kind of way that we'd identify them sort of logos colors things like that and brand image is what we think how we think about the clinic or how we feel about things so let me look at the identity first. So you probably know and recognize these logos because these are world famous brands that they don't even need to have their names on them. We know who they are. So we can identify them. But the next thing that comes after we've identified them is a feeling or a thought or an association that we have with each of those companies. So you may find, for instance, that um, I don't know, that you, you love McDonald's here, something like that, or you hate McDonald's, or you have strong feelings about Starbucks coffee. It's, um, it's a way of, um, of way we feel about things, and that then makes us associate with them, and it draws us towards them or pushes us away from them. So you may love a McDonald's because you think a little bit of unhealthy is never bad, or you may hate it. So that's why feelings is really important to go along with brands. And then as I said brand image, it's that more than a logo, it's the association that consumers have with every interaction that they have with your business. So in a way, it's an association they have about the feelings they have with every single thing to do with your clinic. So you may have an you may be amazing in your treatment room, you may have like the best treatment ever. But if people can't, you know, get to you, if your receptionist is mean, if they hate sitting in your clinic, then they may never come back because it's just not an, an association they like to have. So your clinic personality is a makeup of brand identity and brand image. So how do we do this? This all sounds great. This is something we want. We want a clinic personality that's going to attract patients, but how are we gonna do it? So first of all, you need to know your exact brand colors and font so you can get your clinic identity super clear. And then you need to think number two, about what your values are for your clinic, which is something I don't think we often think about at all. And then you need to communicate those values with a mission statement that you share with your team. And then finally, you need to create an exterior or in, an interior of your clinic that matches your values, your mission, and the personality that you want your clinic to have. So what I'm gonna to do today is go through how you can do these things for your clinic. So. Um, brand and font. So these are kind of the easy starting points. So if you don't, most people know what their font is. If you don't know what your font is, what you're, you know, what your your writing is typed in, what, what it looks like, then you can just go to Google and find, say, find my font, and there'll be numerous websites that you can upload stuff into that will tell them. Um, this is my favourite colour picker tool, which if you go to Chrome, you can, you know, click on the little jigsaw puzzle piece, and it will give you an option to add this to your toolbar. Um, and then all you do is you click on, so if I wanted to, I would just click on this color here, and then it would tell me what color that is. It tells you in two numbers, in um, RGB and CMYK. And that is then what you would use to create your social media, your website, your printing. If you were getting a designer or something else to do something, you'd give that color. Now, it doesn't mean that you only use those colors, 
descriptive or only use those fonts, but those would be your main ones. And then you can add accent ones around that if you need to, but it just helps make your clinic easily identifiable to patients. I've had it once where I was looking for, I think I was looking for a guttering or something really boring like that. And there was an ad in the newspaper, like we have a local paper. So, and they had their logo on there and everything. So I went to the website and it looked completely different. Like the logo was different, the colors were different, the font was different. And I was like, this is wrong. And it was the same company. The phone number was the same and the address was the same, but I didn't use them because there'd been so mismatched between what they'd first shown me and then what they'd shown me that I was like, I don't trust this. Something is really not right here. And they were probably fine. They just probably had done a different newspaper advert. But any time where people don't follow through, then that creates um, sort of a, a dissociation. People go, oh, this isn't right. And it may not be a conscious thought. It can be a subconscious thought. And we don't want any of that kind of uncertain feeling loitering in the back of patients' heads if they've come in expecting one thing and they've got something completely different. It's why we tend to put our pictures on our website so people know who they're going to come and see. They know what we look like. Then we think about what our values are. Now, this is maybe something, maybe something you've never done before, but I know with people that I've worked with, when they start digging into these values, it really helps them have a much stronger idea of, of why they're doing what they're doing, and then makes it easier communi to, to communicate that, not only to their patients um, and to their team, but to everyone who's, who they're working with, so that everyone has a really good idea of what's going on. So if you're a sole practitioner, then obviously there's just you, your values are gonna be your own. And in the clinic, then the values tend to closely mi mirror the clinic principle. There may be some slight changes, but they're generally very much the same. And by having these, it underpins everything. So I'll show you my values. So total chiropractic, total chiropractic and total health live in the same place, but they are two distinct brands, mostly because when I set up the clinic, I thought the osteopath wouldn't want to work in a building called Total Chiropractic. So I called it Total Health West Berkshire so that there would be a slight difference between the two. So Total Chiropractic's values are professional, integrity, patient-centered, and a passion for health. So that means that when, whenever I'm doing anything with my patients, whenever I'm talking about my clinic, these are the values that I hold, that I'm gonna uphold against anything else. If I was gonna go into them further, I might say that I'm a very laid back professional. You know, I'm very good at my job. I'm very highly qualified. I'm good at what I do, but I'm not really like, I don't really big it up. I'm quite relaxed when I talk to people, but I can bring out the clinician and the professional staff as and when I need to. And I can step it back when I don't have to. And because I carry that, you know, just generally within myself and probably because I've been in practice for a while, that isn't a problem for me. You know, when I just started, I might have needed to be more professional or more, you know, more bored professional, but more now I can be more laid back. But having these things means that the patients know, you know, integrity is really important to me. So patients know that I'm always going to be honest about their care. So I could have honesty there. And there's lots of other things that would be important to me. These are just the top four. And then we go to total health and they're very similar. You know, we've got um, professionalism, exceptional service to patients and practitioners, a passion for health, honesty and friendliness, because that's what I want people to feel they're getting when they come into my clinic. Now, these values not only help underpin everything you do in your treatment room, they can help you make business decisions as well. So, for instance, for total health, you know, exceptional service to patients and practitioners is one of my really high values that I want to have. So when I've had receptionists who have not been as good at their job as I've wanted to, and I've been differing about should I keep them or should I get, you know, get rid of them, I've gone back to this, you know, my value is exceptional service. Are they providing exceptional service? No, they're not. So therefore they have to go because if I'm not, I'm not sticking to my values. And it's not just a kind of my values are important to me. They're there for a reason. If I don't provide exceptional service, then practitioners may choose to rent their room somewhere else. Patients may choose to go somewhere else because their service they've got isn't what they expect. So that's why the, having a value there and communicating it is really important. In the same way, when I was setting up Total Health, I decided I didn't want to have energy therapy, Reiki, things like that in the clinic. Just didn't want it because there was another clinic in the area that had that, and I wanted to distinguish myself from it to make it different. And that's what I promised people who were joining the clinic, that, that there wouldn't be any of that there. Now, when I first opened the clinic and, you know, I'd spent a fortune on it and I had no money, I had a psychic come and say, well, I'd like to rent some rooms and do some readings. And although I desperately wanted the money, I said no. 
because it wasn't holding up to my values of what I promised people. So that's how values can help you guide you through many different decisions, as well as underpinning the care that you're going to give patients. Um, so that's values. And it can, if you get start digging quite deep into it, it can really profoundly make you think about why you do what you do. And that can then help you have more confidence in how you treat and things like that. So mission statement number three, what are you trying to achieve? That's what your mission statement is. And the reason we have this is to keep everyone pointing in the same direction and doing the same kind of thing. So I think here I have some uh, examples of um, mission statements. So Google, our mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Apple, bringing the best user experience to its customers through innovative hardware, software, and services. And total chiropractic, maybe not the same level as Apple and Google, not yet anyway. So my, tag, my mission statement is getting people out of pain and back to the things they love. So the reason it's important to have that, so this, so this is also my tagline. So a tagline is something that sits underneath um, usually underneath your main business name and it sort of describes what you do slightly more than what your name is. Now the reason that um, we have these things, these mission statements taglines, is that they help tell everyone what we're doing. So for instance if we're looking just in, in the world of chiropractic you can have patients that just want to get out of pain and then you want to have patients that want to go back to the things that they like to do. They want to run, play golf, play with their kids, do a full day's work without being in pain whatever they want to do. If I'm in a clinic and I'm and all of my marketing, my website, my social media is only talking solely about pain, about getting rid of pain, then we're going to attract the people who just want, I don't know, say their pain to be manageable or to not have the pain. And that's when their journey is going to stop. Now, if that's what you want to do, if that's what you want to treat, that's absolutely fine. That's going to get the right people for you. But if what you're really wanting to do is to help people not only get their pain better, but have a healthier life and go back to sports and do new hobbies and, and get the best out of their life. And you're not adding something onto your site or into your marketing to tell people that that's what you want to do. You're not going to attract those patients in. So just by having the, and back to the things they love, tells patients that I'm going to help you get back to that thing that you want to do. And it's quite a subtle way of doing it. It's not like in your face, it's just saying it. But also it helps your front desk, it helps your reception team, particularly if you have people who are new to chiropractic. You know, if you have people join your team who don't know what chiropractors are and they're thinking, oh, gosh, we're booking all these treatments in and we're offering all these advice and I don't know nutrition and, and orthotics and all different sorts of things. Why are we doing that? They may feel it's all a financial based thing. That's maybe it's a lot of our fears. I know we have a fear about overselling. A lot of us have that. And it may be that maybe a new team member they may think that's all what it's about. And they may be uncertain about that. But we're saying, actually, no, the reason we're, we're booking a course of care is we want to not just get that person out of pain. We want to get them to their, their favorite sports. We want to get rid of their headaches. We want to make them feel great. We want to get them healthier. Then they understand why we're doing that. And then we're all on board the same mission. And the same if you're looking, you know, you're getting associates in, if you have someone join you. They need to know that that's what your clinic is aiming for. If they're just thinking, actually, what we're trying to do is get as many appointments in as we can, and that's not what your mission is, you're going to get the wrong people. So having a mission statement not only helps your front desk tell your patients what you want, not only helps you and your associates and other people you refer to know what you want, but it helps tell patients who are looking for treatment that they're, you're the right clinic for them. So that's that one there. I've just gone through the why. And as I said, it brings a unity of your team and it tracks the patients who want the same thing. And as I said, now that you've got your values and your mission statement, you shout about them. So you don't necessarily have to, you know, if you go to people like Google or um, Apple or Nike or something like that, they will have a mission statement page and say and have all these things on there. You don't have to do that. You can just um, make sure that you're putting words that will communicate that for your social media, on your website, in the way that you talk to people, in, in the way that you set out your clinic. So you, you don't need to, you can put it on there if you want, you like have it as your tagline. Um, it's also useful, your tagline is also useful to, uh, to use something that's called an elevator pitch. And that's American, we could call it a lift pitch. Basically, it's a way of describing what you do in the time it would take an elevator to arrive when you press the button. And the reason that it's useful to have a very quick way of saying this is that if you say we're to bump into a GP or 
someone was asking you at a party about what you do, there's different ways you can answer it. But if you have a really snappy way of answering it, then it gets it done quickly and it makes it look like, you know, what you're doing. Whereas if you go, if someone says, oh, what do you do? And I go, oh, I'm a chiropractor and I kind of treat back pain and headaches and neck pain and I adjust people and I do some soft tissue work. Oh, and that's true. That's what I do. But it sounds a bit clumsy. Whereas if you say, oh, what's your chiropractor? Oh, I'm a chiropractor. I, I get people out of pain and back to the things they love. That's more interesting, like to me anyway, maybe because I'm a chiropractor. And so talking about adjusting gets, you know, we, we do that all day long. But um, if it's more inspirational, it's more aspirational, it's going to take people with you. Because then if, whoever it is, be they a GP you're talking to, someone at a party, oh, how do you do that? And then you can go into more depth. But it just gives people a taster of what you do. And if you can have this so it just falls off your tongue, then it means you don't have to suddenly go, ah, what is it that I do? And then maybe come across not as well than if you have a very slick tagline elevator pitch you can just talk about there. Good. So, as I said, these can, values and mission statement can be communicated through your tagline, your elevator pitch, your website, and your social media. I mean, you will never see particularly um, getting things out of paying back to the things they love on social media at the moment. I haven't got that on there. You won't see my values on my website or my social media, not written down like that but they hopefully are coming through in everything that I do, in every interaction that they have with people and in how the clinic feels. So, um, exactly. So every single interaction you have with your patients will communicate this, which is why it's so important to have patients, everyone in you know, your team, your reception staff, your associates on board with the same, same message so that it's getting communicated for. And now number four, create an interior and exterior of your clinic that matches the personality that you want it to have. Now, I think we spend an awful lot of time thinking about the practicalities of our clinic. So what benches we're going to have, where's the reception desk going to go, things like that. I don't think we think much about what it actually really looks like necessarily. Um, and that's something that I've done a lot with, with my, in my clinic. So this is my clinic. Now, it's in a grade two listed barn, and I've gone with that. So this wasn't the intention. When I set up my clinic, it wasn't going to look like a shabby chic boutique, boutique hotel. That wasn't what I thought it was going to look like. But um, when I started to furnish it, and I had absolutely no money to furnish it at all, I realized that if I brought cheap furniture, it looked rubbish. So what we've done a lot of is painting painted old furniture that we got very cheap in a secondhand shop. Um, and it's created this image. Now, obviously your clinic does not need to look like my clinic, but, what by having this image it means that people walk in and they relax they go oh this is nice and then they say oh this will make a nice house and I go no because it's my clinic um but I think what I spent a lot of time now that I started going down this route is thinking how it looks what the feel is like how people feel when they walk in is it welcoming is it relaxing you know we have nice music playing we have coffee all that kind of stuff so that's the kind of thing that I think everyone should be thinking about their clinics, not necessarily, you know, going for the grey shabby chic thing, but when people walk into your clinic, what do they think? What do they feel? Because that is super important because that's the impression they will take away with them. That's what the personality of your clinic will be for them. So thinking about how you have signs up. So as I said, I've got 16 therapists in my clinic. I don't allow them to, they, they want stuff, promotional stuff, they have to give it to me and I put it out. I don't allow them just to shove your posters on the wall because if you did that, it would get really crowded, really busy and that's stressful for people's heads having tons and tons of stuff. So, you know, there's a post I put in my practice builders community, everything is in a gold frame. Like no one puts anything up just in a kind of little plastic frame, like that drives me insane. Um, I'm really fussy about how the cups look. And a little bit is a bit OTT and people wind me up about it, but it's so that it looks like a nice place. Now, if you, if it's difficult to do when you, when you go there all the time. So if you're not sure how your clinic looks, what impression it gives, then find a friend whose judgment you trust, who won't just say it's great, who hasn't been to your clinic very much and get them to walk in and say, how do you feel when you walk in? What is your first impressions? Um, when I did the BCA session, I was talking about when I went to my dentist and what my, the NHS dentist that my children see, and the building, oh my gosh, it's shabby. There's paint falling off the wall. There's flooring's a mess. And also it's an NHS dentist. They haven't got any money and they haven't got any time, but it looked run down and horrible. Now, 
an NHS clinic can kind of get away with that because you're not expecting it to be nice. But we're private health and our buildings should look immaculate and beautiful and wonderful. So that's, I think, the thing that we need to think about quite a lot. And it's and it can be entirely in your keeping. So as I said, your clinic needs to have the character that reflects your values, mission statement and the building that it sits in. So if you're in a super modern building, you'll probably not want to go the way that I've done. You might want it to look quite funky, quite cool. You know, if you've got a certain thing that you really love, I don't know, say you love windsurfing and you're near and you're near the sea and a lot of people have a, a passion for the sea, then you could bring that into the clinic. It would just add a bit more fun, a bit more character, and it's going to attract people who like that kind of thing. If you're a sports clinic, maybe you could go down the whole idea of lots and lots of different sports memorabilia, not in a tacky way, I've seen a really classy way, but because people would like that, that's going to attract the patients you have in because you're going to have those pictures on your website and people go, oh, I want to go there. Like if you're looking for a hotel or a restaurant and you look at the website and you'll see a little bit of the hotel, a little bit of the restaurant and you'll be like, I want to be there having a really well kind of interior clinic can give you the same same thing patients go yes they, they they've got their qualifications they look nice their website makes sense and i want to go and be in that clinic because it looks cool um and clean and tidy and uncluttered so it's very easy not to see the mess so this is a kind of before picture and then this is an after picture so i kind of i'm i am completely um what's the word, obsessive about walking around the clinic and making sure it looks nice, picking up things that people have left behind, making the chairs sure everything's all nice and tidy. You know, we have a bird cushion that someone keeps putting with the birds upside down, which drives me insane, so I keep putting it way up. It all sounds really finickety, but it makes an impression. If, your clinic, if people walk into your clinic and it's a mess, they are gonna think your treatment's a mess or that you're a mess or that it's not good. If everything is clean and ordered and clinical, clinical then that will make people feel that that's the way that you practice. Um, okay, that's so that's all I want to say. I'm happy to answer any questions that people have. If you want to um, start doing this um, procedure, start helping yourself out, then grab your phone, do the QR code. There's a clinic brand checklist that will take you through the things that I've spoken about um, to help you start implementing this in your clinic. And I said it may feel a bit. Um, away from what we've ever been taught about marketing, but it's so, so important. Um, the easiest way to think about it is if you know when sports stars do something that's a little bit naughty, how quickly they get dropped from their brands because the brands do not want that association with anything that is not on their image. And I think we should think of ourselves in the same way. We don't want anything in our clinics that is not projecting the image that we want, whether that's on our marketing, on our website, in our clinics, or how we interact. Yeah, excellent. Chris, that's that's the end of my presentation now. I'll happily take questions if anyone has any. Um, do I need to pass back control to you? Brilliant, yeah, if you just make me host on the next one. But um, that's great, thanks though, Rosie. Really, really helpful. Um, it's funny, we, um, Stefan and I were having a chat about this a little, um, about a month ago about the, the clinic design and the decor. Do you have any advice for sort of the, the exterior of the clinic? Because I think a lot of us think about, I know for me, I look at what it's like inside. And it was only after we had this chat, I actually went and looked at the outside of the building and thought, oh, there's, there's some definite room for improvement. I think it depends. Obviously, sometimes it can be tricky as to what you're allowed to do. I mean, like we're a listed building. We're not technically allowed to have a sign on the outside. I mean, we have a sign. But um, I think basically, even, even if there's not obviously a nice coat of paint does wonders. Um, if it's if it's doable, we have hanging baskets outside. We have tubs with plants in it. If that's doable, that's fine. If not, just make sure it's clean and tidy. So sometimes I'll go around with, a, you know, with a litter, a bag of rubbish and just pick up litter and things like that. Because I think litter outside your clinic looks dreadful. Like there's nothing you can do to, you know, usually it's not your patients drop it. The wind blows it in. But that kind of thing, I think, really helps. And just good signage, because people get, if people are already in pain and worried, just making sure people can find you. Yeah, I think that's that's key, isn't it? If you turn up, um, I had this experience recently at a hotel um, we were staying at, and it looked lovely, but we all got there and went, where's the entrance? We sort of, like somebody wandered this way and somebody wandered that way. And it was, it was we found it and it was a hotel and it was okay. But I think if you're a patient, especially if you're in pain and it hurts to move, that's the first impression is all oh, friction. Like I'm not really sure kind of where to go here. Um, and I really like your the, the elevator pitch idea. Um, 
it sounds like what kind of what you're going for is to get that oh how do you do that kind of response is that yeah. sort of is that the mark of a good elevator pitch then if, if you get that kind of response to it i think it's to to get curiosity mm. i think about what you want to do because particularly if you're at some kind of networking event people are going to have been saying to you or it's been speaking to millions of people about what they do and if you just tell them straight away then then they might stop talking to you but actually if you say something that might inspire you know either curiosity or aspiration then that I think that helps more because then they're going to go oh because they might say because often when I was networking I'd say when I first started I'd be saying oh um oh yeah I help people with back pain now and they go oh great we don't know anyone that has back pain at the moment but we'll let you know mm. when they say I oh, get them back to the things they love and they might go oh well do you know what I don't hurt but I can't I, I wanted to go running and I can't because of my knee but that's something I always have and then it creates a different conversation because if people often have like you know knee pain they've just been told that's what they're going to have so they don't think that there's a fix for that problem but that might be another way into that conversation mm. yeah and I guess you've got two other sort of advantages to that where on the one hand it gets people out of thinking just about pain and more about function but that's something we're often trying to get patients to do anyway there's that whole oh as soon as the pain's gone, we they drop out before we've actually gotten better. Um, but also, I don't know about you, I've had this experience with some patients where sometimes the pain hasn't got better, but mm. they've been able to do the activity they wanted to do. So they, they go, well, the pain hasn't changed, but I'm actually really happy and I'm really glad I came, even if the pain is still there. Yeah, and I think often, because I know a lot of us now are thinking of trying not to think of just the pain, but actually the function. And so it starts planting that seed in people's minds before mm. they even come through the door. And I'm curious as well, when you were talking about um, the mission statement, you've obviously got a, a pretty big team there. When you're creating that, is that, do you believe that should be done sort of as a democracy with everybody? Or is it more of a benevolent dictatorship of, no, no, this is my clinic and we can't have too many chefs? Oh, I'm a benevolent dictator when it comes to clinic. Like it's, obviously people can have an input, but essentially if, if it's your clinic, then it's your, it's your baby, it's your mission statement. Um, obviously you can clarify people and people may say okay this is how you see it but I see it slightly differently but as long as you're heading in the same direction um, then I think it's up to you what, you know whatever you want to do. Yeah I can imagine with, with 16 clinicians trying to get them all to agree getting two clinicians to agree, agree is pretty tough. <laughs> exactly and often also with um, so with those most of those clinicians they although they rent rooms they don't work for me they're all self-employed so they'll have their own individual mission statements about what they're doing. And they may not have formalized them, but we all have our mission statements. We all have our reason we do what we do. Mm. It's formalizing it. And if you have a team telling the people who, who you, without, without want of a better word, that you control, this is what we're doing, then it helps them to, to know which path we're taking. Mm. So I, I kind of have this image. It's a bit like you're all going to go on this voyage on a ship and, you know, you might be heading to one part of America, they might be heading to somewhere else, you might be going to take a job, somebody else might be going to visit family, you can have all these different intentions, but you've all got to agree that no, we're getting on the same ship and we're going to take the same voyage. If, if somebody else is going, well, I actually want to go to, you know, China or New Zealand, we don't want them on the same ship, that's not going to work well for everybody. Exactly. And also, it's really good if you're looking to either hire rooms out to people or if you're looking to take an associate on or something like that. If you're talking to them and they are so far away from what your mission statement is, then you may decide that you don't want them in your clinic mm. because they're just going to be a disruptor. You know, if, like when, when I was looking for an associate, I was like, I need someone who can come in and work and not be big headed and not be chiropractic the only thing in the world because I have lots of other therapists and we all have to play nicely together that kind of thing and equally if I had another practitioner coming in who I thought was going you know someone wanted to come in but I'd know that she taught badly about other professions and I'm like yeah you're not joining because I'm not I don't want to have to manage that on a daily basis so I'm just gonna do the pain point straight away and say no mm -hmm. so it helps you to build your clinics as well because you're having people who want the same things in the same building which makes life easier it seems like yeah I, think, I mean this is the impression I get with a lot of your message actually is if you can simplify and be a bit more selective, you can stop a lot of the stresses most practitioners feel from actually getting into your life. Yeah, I mean, I've, done, I've, I've not done that in times in my life. And I sometimes I've gone back and gone, oh, I knew I should have said no. I knew I should have not let them in or I knew I should have done that. And then you just have to manage. But the more that you start to have the confidence to go, ah, my gut is saying this and your gut is really wrong, I think, then you just go, no. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's sometimes tricky at the start. There's all these voices in your head, but 
you can take the time to sit back and just think and, and wait, then you start to get actually, I'm still feeling resistant to this for some reason. Maybe I should listen a little bit. Yeah. And I often think that with decision making generally, I always say make decisions cold, not hot. Mm. So if you're making it in that really either angry or quick or excited way, then that's usually a decision that you're going to come back and regret. So I have a very good line now, whereas I always go, um, oh, that sounds great. I just need to discuss it with my clinic manager first. Because that means I then it's then stop it's and it's not for them, it's for me, it's to stop me making the decision then, even though I know what I want to do, because I need to go and think about it. And it just makes it stops me doing it because you know, nine times out of ten, I'm still going to do the same thing. But the one time it will stop me from doing the thing that I'll then regret for six months, it's worth doing. Yeah, you don't end up jumping on the next shiny thing, next shiny thing. That's that's from my experience, that's a painful lesson I've had to learn more than once. <laughs> it's so occasional. Um, I had one quick question about fonts, actually, when you were talking about that. This came up for me. Um, I was at a cafe yesterday, and the road outside, um, there was a builder's van that went past, mm. and it had sort of, uh, they work in Tunbridge Wells, and it had like the, the crest of Tunbridge Wells, and this, this lovely script font that looked like very, very formal, almost a little bit old worldy. And I thought, oh, that, that looks like somebody who really does a very good job. I couldn't read their email address. Yeah. It grabbed my attention because it looked like somebody I knew. I was like, is that, I actually can't tell if it's Turco or Turbo for the name. Do you have any advice on, on how you balance that? Because you could obviously go really clear, but it could be a bit clinical. Yeah. In terms of choosing a font for your practice. I think that you just, I think, I mean, when I chose my fonts, I think literally I just went, I just wrote something out, a few little things like the name and the email address and other things. And then I just went through all the fonts that I liked. But one of the things is, can you read it? Mm. And is it, or, or if you put words to get letters together, are they going to start looking a little bit funny? Because, and particularly if we're going for a population where maybe we might have elderly people who who struggle to read stuff without putting their glasses on and all that kind of stuff. We want to make sure that it's super easy to read. And also that if you make it smaller or bigger, so if it's bigger on a website or smaller on a low, on a mobile or on a social media, that you can still read it easily. And I think if you have fallen in love with a, with a font, but you can't read your website name, then don't use it. And you can't read the phone number, then don't use it. Or have a secondary font. So you can have like, say, so we could have like total chiropractic in a really flowery lovely beautiful thing and then the bit the, the sort of out of the things you love kind of thing in a slightly different font that complements it and then that other font would be the one that has all the factual writing in and then more flowery writing might have the more description mm. so if you fall in love with one you can always have a complementary one but that's a good idea so you're going for the slightly clearer one that's like okay here's the bit i need you to read like yes, the back stuff this is the nice stuff yeah i, I read a study a while ago showing that um how legible something was affected how well people believed it so if you were going to read an argument for a certain political position or something like that if it was like a gray font on a white background and it was a bit faded or if the font was quite script it swayed a lot less people like the easier it is to read the less brain power it takes to actually interpret what's on the page or on the screen the more people are inclined to go oh that makes sense yeah i think that's the thing we want to make everything really clear and not too not not too fussy because I think people and also have to remember that people read at a much lower reading age on screens than they do in real life. So everything has to be clear and crisp and not in your face. And I think also not too bright. I think sometimes your stuff is too light. Ah, you're like, oh, I can't even look at that. So we don't want any of that. Particularly patients with migraines, that's not going to go down well. <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine that being a problem. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Rosie. That was really helpful. Um, Rosie's gonna be um Oh, sorry, Simon asked, what's the reading issue online? Um, so why do you think that is? Do we, do we know why it's harder to read online? Or I, it think it's, screens? I think it's more that when, we, when we're reading online in a kind of leisure way, we're not bringing our, our full brain to it. You know, so you're not, we just don't, I, I don't actually know. It's just something I've read on many, many things is that we read at a much lower age. So we, we write. So when you write on your website, you don't want your technical stuff in there. And I think if you think like for yourself, I mean, I know that for me, if I need to read anything that's important, I have to read it on paper. I won't read it on si size on phones. On, um, so size of so sorry, swapping issues now. So 
Um, yeah, so the reading age is just we just read it lower age because it's difficult to read and we're not bringing our, our full thinking brains into our leisure time. You know, if you if you're just searching for something and suddenly it's wanting you to do proper hard reading, the likelihood is we can do it, but we might put it back to later. So people would generally write at a lower, lower age. Um, and that's not because people are stupid. It's just because we're not we're not in that thinking mode. Size of font on phones, too. Yeah. If you have a responsive website, then that should sort it out for you. So um, when you get, if you build your own website, if you get someone to build your website for you, you want it to be a responsive site, which means that it will change the dimensions of things to look good on a mobile. Um, sometimes it needs to be fiddled with, um, but whenever you're doing your site or someone's done your site, always look at it on a mobile as well as a desktop. And the mobile is more important because more search happens on mobile than desktop these days. But yeah, and Google will downrank you if you can't read it or if your buttons are too close to best give us if people can't touch them with their thumbs. Uh, that's interesting. I didn't know Google would uh, would affect that as well. Yeah. Yeah, usability issue. Um, I think is it I think it's pingdom.com or I can't I can't remember the other one. There's two sites you can put your website in and it will spit out all the things that it doesn't like about it. And then you can okay. either fix it yourself or give it to your technical guy or girl because well that's way above my technical skills. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer in outsourcing that kind of stuff as well. I built my first website using Squarespace and it looked all right in the end, but it took weeks. And now I, I have somebody who knows what they're doing who can get it done straight away there. Um, is it pingdom.com? Yes. Pingdom.com, brilliant. So that's really useful, I think, to look at that as well for websites. Yeah, it'll, it'll spit out a load of stuff. And it, I mean, with Google ranking, it's mostly speed and security, but they'll tell you the things that will are wrong and then you give it to your designer and they will sort it out for you. Um, right, how do I make you um, host, Chris? Am I host now? Or? I haven't done, I can't, how do I do okay. it? You go into participants and you can see everyone's names. There's three little dots. Oh, it says reclaim. Oh, I can steal it back from you. I didn't Yay! <laughs> That's okay. a bit easier. Brilliant. Well,